Welcome to another Sir James D. Tech video. Today I'll be conducting the unboxing and review for the ASUS Maximus 4 Extreme P67 motherboard. Okay, here we go. I know a lot of you out there have anxiously anticipated this unboxing. And so what I'm gonna do for this video is actually combine the unboxing and the review into one video. Now, as you know, this is a tremendously difficult board to get your hands on. It is sold out literally everywhere. And it was listed on Newegg for about a half hour and I was just lucky enough to snag one. Now, this board was a bit pricey at $350 plus shipping, but supply and demand, nobody's carrying it. So once you get an opportunity, you better jump on it. Now, once again, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with this board, this is the brand new P67 chipset in which it is socket 1155. You can see ASUS has a brilliant feature on the box here, this window view. Now this board is compatible with Intel's newly released Sandy Bridge processors, which I have the i7-2600K unlocked multiplier, and there will be a review video upcoming on that. Ah! Interesting way ASUS does this. Little two box setup here. There we got a Republic of Gamers case sticker, which if I decide to put that on, will probably be on the back side panel. Or I suppose I could put it on my door. <laughs> very nice. It's like cable identification stickers, which comes in very handy by the way. Alright, this is the ROG USB cable. ROG, of course, standing for Republic of Gamers. ASUS has supplied us with thermal sensors. And again, keep these little packets away from children and dogs. <laughs> this looks to be the ASUS 3-way SLI bridge. Just get it open real quick. got kind of a brownish tint to it. I suppose it's better than diarrhea brown. All right, here's a quick connect pack for the ROG Pro Belt, which I'll show you in a few minutes on the board where this connects to. And then speaking of diarrhea brown, here we have an SLI bridge. Yeah, that doesn't make me puke in my mouth. Seriously, who has a setup where that color scheme would fit? All right, the Maximus 4 Extreme includes zip ties. And this little module here is actually for Bluetooth connection. Those of you with smartphones and iPads, and then basically a few clicks of the mouse and you're able to overclock, you're able to do so many different things just from your phone. Okay, and here is the Crossfire Bridge. And you all can probably guess what I feel about the color. Okay, what these are is extenders for the front panel connectors. Don't think I'll use those because I've got a case where it's got a very nicely placed cable management hole. Here we've got a USB 2.0 plate, which you can place in any available expansion slot, and you just connect the end to an available USB 2.0 header on your motherboard. The I.O. shield. <laughs> I gotta say, this is the most tricked out I.O. shield I think I've ever seen. Usually it's just a boring, sharp hunk of tin. SATA cables, SATA cables everywhere. Looks like you get four SATA 2 and four SATA 3 cables. They all have locking ends, and one of the ends on each is right angled, so that's nice. Here's an ROG feature guide, which is going over things like Republic of Gamers Connect, the Bluetooth application, which I mentioned, just kind of a quick start guide for those things. And the Maximus 4 Extreme Disc, which believe it or not, does not just contain drivers. And then an absolutely exhaustive manual. Well, you can bet I'm gonna be pouring over this thing. 
All right, I'll get my nose out of this book and give you a little closer look at the board now. Here's the bottom half of the Maximus 4 Extreme. You can see very clearly that it has four PCI Express 2.0 slots. One of the main drawing points for me in this board is the fact that it's got the four pin Molex connectors, which supply the proper allocation for power into the PCI lanes instead of demanding entirely on the 24 pin for that power. This right here has the NF200 chip directly underneath it, and the defining characteristic of that is that when engaged, it allows two graphics cards to run at their full 16 bandwidth capabilities. Now I'm going to try to very simply go over the layout here for the PCI lanes. When you've got a single card in slot 1, you'll be running 16 native. If you've got two cards in slots 1 and 3, it'll be running at X8 native. Now what you have to do in order to engage the NF200 is have a card occupying PCI Express slot 1 and it can be a graphics card, sound card, something in there and then a graphics card each in slots 2 and 4 and then because that first slot is occupied 2 and 4 will then run at 16. Now that's what the specifications say however a little later on I'll connect some benchmarks in order to see which exactly is faster the Intel native 8 or the NF200 16. You got the front panel audio connector and then directly to the right of that is where you plug in those thermal sensors I showed you. Then here's a couple of four pin fan connectors, a total of four USB 2.0 headers, front panel connectors for your case, and then there's the BIOS switch as this board does have dual BIOS support. There's the Southbridge heatsink under which is the Intel P67. Now we have a total of eight SATA connectors, four of which are your standard SATA 2, running off the P67 chipset, two of which are SATA 3, running off the Intel P67 chipset, and those top two red ones are the Marvel SATA 3 connectors. All right, where I'm pointing now are the PCI Express Lane disable switches. On this board is the go button, Right over here is where those multimeter testers go. The start switch and the reset switch, which again are superbly placed. Some other motherboard manufacturers place these directly underneath the bottom PCI Express slot. And up here is an LN2 switch, which is liquid nitrogen. And then here's the debug LED. Got some more four pin fan headers can see that there are four dim slots and in case some of you are unfamiliar what you want to do is if you only have two modules you put them in the red slots which are two and four and then here's something I find just wonderfully creative and useful when you unhitch the bar to open the CPU socket bracket well just for informational purposes the Maximus 4 Extreme does contain the loads bracket on it you don't got to go in there with your fingernails or whatever and try to pick that thing open. You just raise the bar up high enough and the thing opens up for you. That little black button up there is the Q reset switch. Then we got some very sharply designed heat sinks. Goes extremely nicely with this board. This right here is a USB 3.0 header. Still yet a couple more four pin fan connectors. And then up here is a four pin power connector which if you take this little cap right off, it becomes an 8-pin power connector. And then I'll give you a quick view of the I.O. panel. Here we got the PS2 mouse and keyboard port, a total of count them, eight USB 3.0 ports. Here we have the clear CMOS switch, necessary for every board, the optical out port, two eSATA ports, dual LAN ports. This is where you plug in that ROG connect cable to a laptop and then push that little button next to it. And then here you've got all your audio IO ports. And then I'll give you a nice little look-see on the EFI BIOS here in which, excuse me while I kiss the sky, you're able to use your mouse. You can see I've got the CPU level up at 4.6 gigahertz right now. But of course you're able to go in there and 
do everything manually if you really want to. Now what you should know is with this chipset, there's no more DDR3-2000. It's 2133 or 1866. Main information screen. I, of course, have two RAID 0 rays rocking. Now this is something I've used already. The ASUS Easy Flash 2 utility in which you just put a BIOS.ROM file onto a jump drive, navigate to that jump drive, double click on it and it reads the image and you're off and running flashing your BIOS. And then BIOS flashback in case you screw something up. And then of course here's the easy mode, which I don't find particularly useful, but... Hey, it's there if you want to look at it or check the time. <laughs> All right, what I'd like to do now is just peruse the ASUS AI Suite 2. This is a brilliant utility in which you're able to overclock, toggle your voltages, monitor temperatures, even update your BIOS directly from your desktop. All right, here we are in the EVO. You can see it's showing me all my major settings which Intel speed step is the reason that says 1.6 gigahertz right there. I'm actually at 4.6 right now. There's an auto tuning capability, which you press either fast or extreme. There are various tools at your disposal. There's some sort of carbon emission calculator for those of you who feel guilty for breathing. There's a nice fan program in which you get to custom design a profile and a very useful tool called Probe 2 in which you can increase and decrease your voltages. Now be aware that doing this could cause you instant instability. So just be careful. And then here's an awesome feature. They allow you the option to update your BIOS directly from the internet server. Again, before you flash a BIOS, make sure you have your settings at default. And then something that was on that ASUS Maximus driver disk is a custom Republic of Gamers skin for CPU-Z, which everybody should use for overclock validation in my opinion. All right, so what I'd like to do now is show you the results of those benchmarks I performed using two graphics cards, in which case two ASUS GTX 580s, comparing the Intel native 8.8 versus the NF200 16.16. And these were static tests, meaning I used the exact same overclock, the exact same settings, did a full uninstallation and reinstallation of drivers in between. So it is a true head-to-head. -head. And without further delay, I present those results to you. Honestly, that sort of what I was dreading would happen was that there would be inconclusive results. So it really depends what you want. Now, what I will say is this. It is, of course, very nice to have that chip in case you get three graphics cards. And in my case, I will be waiting for a single slot GPU to be released, which is powerful enough to keep up as a physics card with these two GTX 580s and SLI. You can't just throw a 9800 GT in there anymore and expect it to be effective. Now, in my opinion, this is definitely an A-plus run-out-and-buy-it product. However, I do feel uncomfortable levying an official verdict upon a motherboard which isn't fully optimized yet with beta BIOSes and such. I promise to keep you apprised in upcoming Maximus videos how things are progressing and if my verdict changes in any way. Just a few nitpicky things. 
I wish the X1 slot was placed above the top PCI Express slot. Thought we were past that design flaw. And also, this is just my opinion for most motherboard manufacturers, is that if they send along a tri-SLI bridge, they should probably think about packing two crossfire bridges to enable tri-fire. But again, those are just two little quibbles I have. So there's my setup. She's a beast, and no, I do not have a system name. I'm not that cliche. <laughs> so upcoming will be, of course, the Intel i7-2600K review. I've got a full tower case to review. I've got a Prolimitech GPU cooler coming up. And of course, the possibilities are absolutely endless with this spectacular board I have now. Please remember to subscribe to Sir James D Tech and Sir James D DJ, and to check out my website and forums at sirjamesd.com. Talk later.